All right, I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Daniel. And last week I gave you a sales pitch for why we need to study Daniel. And this evening we're going to do something of a background and introduction to the book of Daniel. And eventually we're going to open Daniel and walk through it verse by verse. I think this background will be particularly helpful and I'm violating some of my own principles in doing it. I, I tell guys that are learning to preach that it's not helpful at the front end to just spill a bunch of historical data, background material, authorship, structure, date of writing, and style. Because people don't typically know why they need to listen to those things. And you as the one who have prepared a message, you've been soaking in a passage, soaking in a book, you understand why it's important. But your listeners don't know right away. So uh, throwing all of that advice right out the window and the guys who have been through the trust are already grinning and smiling going, you never do what you tell us to do and you always do what you tell us not to do. This is one of those times. But I think it truly will be helpful for us to understand what is the situation of this book. And hopefully last week was enough of a preview so that you have some hooks to hang some of this data on. This will be a little bit of a historical survey, names, dates, places, geography, uh, some literary devices, and uh, a little bit of the theme and purpose of Daniel. That's where we're headed tonight. But if you've got Daniel open, let's just look together at the, verse, the first verse of the book. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. We have three geological place names, three person names. We need to know who these people are. It's going to take us a little work to get there. So hold on to your horses. You're going to have to listen quickly tonight. So um, let's dive in. What is the book of Daniel about? That's the first question we're going to ask. This is not a biography of Daniel. This is not Daniel's autobiography. This is not a biography of Daniel's three friends, even though those four people show up in the story. This is not a history of the exile. It's not going to give us everything that happened to the exiles in Babylon over 70 years. This book is a glorious self-disclosure of the sovereign God of the universe. The reason this book exists, the reason that God has chosen to reveal himself through Daniel in this book to us is to give a message about himself to Israel and to the Gentile nations. Israel was at a very low point in their history. This book is designed to give them hope from the sovereign God of the universe, but their hope is not going to be fulfilled very soon. In fact, the hope portrayed in this book has not yet been fulfilled to Israel. But God wants them to know that he will keep his covenant promises and his kingdom will come. And to the Gentile nations, God wants to make clear that the God of Israel is the only God and He is in charge and His kingdom will come. Now, if you're a Jew in this room tonight, you, you understand that there's a message here for you. And if you're a Gentile in this room, you understand that there is a message for you. This book is really unique in so many ways. We're going to look into that. When and where was Daniel written? Daniel was written 605 to 536 B.C., from Babylon. By the way, we can get these dates really precise, not only because of the details that Daniel gives us, but the details that come from Kings and Chronicles and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and also details that come from inscriptions and things from ancient Near Eastern archaeology. And the more that archaeologists dig up the Middle East, the more they find that the Bible has been true all along. It, Daniel is a staggering study. Uh, one uh, commentator and archaeologist has said, Dan Daniel is the anvil on which all the hammers of all the critics keep getting shattered. People want to say, the Bible's not true, Daniel can't be true, and then they dig stuff out the ground that affirm that Daniel was true all along. Babylon, by the way, is in Iraq, present-day Iraq, probably 25 miles from present-day Baghdad. That's the region of the world that we're talking about. How was Daniel written? Daniel is broken up into 12 chapters. They're easily discernible breaks. Each of the chapters can kind of stand on its own. And there are two sections to Daniel. The first six chapters are narration of Daniel and his friends, and the last six chapters are the prophetic future related to world history. Daniel is broken up into two languages. Uh, it's unique in that way. Daniel is written in both Hebrew and Aramaic. 
Most of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. There are only a few sections. There's one verse in Genesis, a paragraph or a sentence in Jeremiah, and a few paragraphs in Ezekiel, and then seven whole chapters in Daniel, excuse me, six whole chapters in Daniel written in Aramaic. Aramaic was the language in the Middle East of palaces and politics. It was the lingua franca. When empires ruled, uh, this was the language that everybody spoke. In fact, it was so prevalent that it was the language spoken by the Jews in Palestine in Jesus' day. So you get those common Aramaic phrases that are spoken uh, that show up even in our New Testaments. But the book of Daniel is written half in Aramaic. And this is significant, and it gets at the very purpose of the book. The Hebrew sections are written primarily to the Jewish audience and have Israel concerns. And the Aramaic sections are God's declarations through Daniel, a statesman in a pagan nation, to the Gentile nations. God has a severe message for the nations at large, and especially those petty king tyrants who think they're in charge. And so God speaks to them in their own language through the prophet Daniel in Aramaic. Chapter 1 is an introduction. It's in Hebrew. Chapters 2 through 7 are in Aramaic. That concerns the grand sweep of world history concerning the nations. And chapters 2 to 7 create a fascinating structure. And I'm just going to outline this for you. We'll we'll put this on a chart when we get to chapter 2. But I want to mention it now. Um, You have in the uh, kind of Hebrew literary structures... A telescoping sort of poetry sometimes that focuses in on something right in the middle. And, I, and we have that feature here. Daniel chapter 2 in Aramaic, you have four kingdoms described. And then in chapter 7, you have four kingdoms described. So chapter 2 and chapter 7 are like the outside bread of a sandwich. Okay? Inside there, if you were to use toppings on your sandwich, uh, some sort of sloppy, disgusting, Uh, topping, condiment, or whatever, that would be chapters 3 and 6. And in chapter 3, God delivers Israel, his people, from Gentile persecutors. That's the three friends in the fire. And in chapter 6, God delivers a Jew from Gentile persecutors. That's Daniel with the lions. 3 and 6 are just inside the bread of the sandwich, and they parallel each other. And then right in the middle, chapters 4 and 5 are both about God humbling a Gentile king. Nebuchadnezzar first, and Belshazzar second. And what's fascinating about that is this Hebrew literary feature drives our attention at the middle, at the meat in the sandwich. And what is right there at the middle? The humbling of pagan Gentile kings. This would be so critical for Israel to understand at the low ebb in her history that God is in charge, not these petty tyrants who run world empires. And it would be so critical for those tyrants to understand that even though they think they have sovereignty, God is the one in charge of history. They need to know that. Nebuchadnezzar figured it out, was humbled, and and seems like he turned in repentance. Belshazzar, on the other hand, was just assassinated in unrepentance. The fascinating structure that points at the very purpose of the book. And then in chapters 8 through 12, back to Hebrew, and it is the future history of the Gentile nations through the lens or from the perspective of God's promises to Israel. The coming of Messiah, the rise of Antichrist, the coming of Christ's kingdom, all of it is there. Who was Daniel? Uh, Daniel was a young man, a Hebrew. His name means God is judge or God is my judge, depending on how you spell it, and it's spelled a couple different ways in the scriptures. Um, He was a noble. He may even have been a part of the royal line. He was taken captive probably at 15 years old, taken from his homeland, taken far away to the capital city of the enemy world empire, Babylon. He got a three-year education in Babylon. He had natural abilities. He was given divine enablement for miraculous understanding of dreams. He had uh, resilient faith, constant prayer, and real courage. He was a statesman, an administrator in the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, and the Greek Empire. And Daniel was a prophet, not in the sense of a, thus saith the Lord, walk around the country and give proclamations kind of prophet, like almost all of the other Old Testament prophets. He was an administrator in a pagan regime, but he also received direct revelation from God and interpretations of dreams. He was spoken to by angels, and he wrote down what God told him to write. He was a writing prophet not a ministry proclamation prophet. All that we know of Daniel's early life comes from the book of Daniel. 
but his life uh, later on has attested uh, several other portions of Scripture. In Ezekiel 14, Ezekiel, the prophet who knew Daniel, was a contemporary of Daniel. He was a priest and a prophet, and he was brought over in a second deportation to Babylon and then served as prophet to the Babylonian exiles. Ezekiel says of Daniel, even though, th- even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in the midst of Israel, by their own righteousness they could only deliver themselves, declares the Lord God. At verse 20 of Ezekiel 14, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in its midst, as I live, declares the Lord, they could not deliver either their son or their daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. In Ezekiel 28.3, behold, you are wiser than Daniel, though there is no secret as a match for you. Daniel was highly esteemed in Ezekiel's mind. On a plane with Job and with Noah in terms of righteousness before the Lord and a benefit to God's people. And Ezekiel is using Daniel as a foil to describe the absolute apostate condition of the nation of Israel in exile. Daniel gets mentioned in uh, Matthew 24. The Olivet Discourse, Jesus quotes Daniel. He says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. And Jesus goes on to give instructions to those who will be alive during that time. Jesus calls Daniel a prophet. Jesus obviously uh, considered Daniel a historical figure, much to the chagrin of the liberal critics who believe otherwise. And then you have Hebrews 11, which doesn't mention Daniel by name, but says this, There were those who by faith who conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, and shut the mouths of lions. All of those statements would be true of Daniel. Daniel was respected by Ezekiel, a priest and a prophet to the exiles. Daniel was called highly esteemed by the angel Gabriel. He was called a prophet by Jesus. And the Jewish historian Josephus, lowest on the list of priority, Uh, called Daniel one of the greatest of the prophets. Josephus was a contemporary of Christ and a Jewish historian. It was clear that uh, Daniel and his book were highly revered, both in his day and in subsequent generations down to our own. Let's think about Daniel's age for a moment. He was 15 years old when he was hauled off to Babylon, Daniel chapter 1. In Daniel chapter 2, uh, he receives the or interprets the dream of Nebuchadnezzar in 603 BC. He's probably 17 or 18 years old at that point. Uh, in Daniel chapter 4, uh, when he interprets the second vision of Nebuchadnezzar in 573, Daniel is probably 47 or 48 years old. That's a long reign of Nebuchadnezzar. And then in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel receives the four beast vision. He's 64 years old at that point. In Daniel 8, he gets the ram and goat vision. He's 66 years old. In Daniel chapter 5, um, we have his encounter with Belshazzar and the writing on the wall. He is 80 years old at that point. And then Daniel finds himself in the lion's den in Daniel chapter 6 under Darius the Mede. He is somewhere between 80 and 83 years old. So you know the flannel graphs with the teenager in the lion's den, you got to chuck those. I'm so sorry. Daniel's in his early 80s. In Daniel chapter 9, he's probably 81, receiving the vision of the 77s. And uh, in Daniel chapter 10, under Cyrus, he's 83 years old. It's possible that Daniel uh, gave some editorial notes in his late 80s to his writing and sort of finalized the book of Daniel. And it's likely that he died in his late 80s or early 90s, either in Babylon or in Susa, never went back to Jerusalem. What was the historical situation behind the book of Daniel? I'm going to give you some dates. This is just, this is really exciting, isn't it? Back to history class, uh, ancient Near Eastern history from whenever you took that or were supposed to take that in school. Uh, Let's just start with David and the United Kingdom. David ruled over united Israel, that is, all the tribes together under David from 1010 to 970 B.C. And remember, when we're doing B.C. dates, we're counting down, right? The numbers get smaller as we get closer to our own time. 970 to 930, you have Solomon reigning as king over the United Kingdom. In 966, during Solomon's reign, the temple in Jerusalem is dedicated In 930 B.C., Israel is divided. So Solomon dies, his sons, and the the nation is divided. In 740 to 681, you have Isaiah's ministry. And, And remember, we talked about this last week. Isaiah prophesied Cyrus the Persian 200 years in advance of Cyrus even existing. 
So that's the uh, framework Isaiah's prophecy falls in. And Isaiah comes up significantly in Daniel to explain why the people are in exile. In 722 B.C., you have the fall of the Norman, nor, northern kingdom of Israel. Assyria came in and captured Samaria in 722. And so the northern kingdom has fallen and taken into Assyrian captivity. At that point, Assyria is the world power. The capital of Assyria is Nineveh. You remember the prophet Jonah was a prophet to Nineveh. Habakkuk was a prophet to Nineveh. And Nineveh, uh, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, Assyria was the world power. In 609 B.C., the, the good king Josiah, king of Judah, remember the northern tribes are in Assyrian captivity, but the southern tribes, that's uh, Judah and Benjamin, they're still in Jerusalem, and they've got some good kings, some bad kings. Pharaoh Necho of Egypt is trying to uh, fight both the, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and so he's trying to garner help. And uh, God's prophets had told Israel, don't go look for help from Egypt. I'm going to send you into captivity, go into Babylon, and just live there. Pray for the peace of Babylon. Jeremiah gave the same prophecy. Uh, you're going to live there, have homes, you'll be able to trade, I'll take care of you. You're actually going to be incubated there and taken care of while world empires fight over the world. By the way, the, the center of the Middle Eastern world is Israel. And when the empires fight against each other, they traipse right through there, and Israel's trampled underfoot left and right. So go to Babylon and stay there. Um, Josiah, in following those instructions, is fighting against the Egyptian pharaoh Necho at Megiddo and then is killed. Egypt is vying for power in the region. But in 605 B.C. at the Battle of Carchemish, Babylon finally defeated Egypt to secure the absolute totalitarian reign of the Middle East. And the Battle of Carchemish was fought and won by a brilliant Babylonian general by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And everything that belonged to Egypt, um, basically outside of Egypt at that point, became property of Babylon. So Babylon now owns Israel and Jerusalem. In 605, Daniel was deported along with his three friends, a handful of nobles. 597 B.C., there's a second deportation. 10,000 captives were taken back to Babylon. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar subjugated Jerusalem and held the, the king of Judah um, under his control. And then in 587, when uh, the, the last kings of Judah decided to rebel against Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar came back, destroyed Ju Jerusalem, burned the city, destroyed the temple, took off the rest of the people. So all of this happens in a little over 400 years after David's reign. You go from the golden age of Israel's history, the united monarchy, seems like all these promises are, are happening, and then just disaster. And, and we end up captive in Assyria and captive in Babylon. When Daniel goes to Babylon in 605, he is there eight years before the second deportation. And Ezekiel comes over in the second deportation, then ministers to the people in exile. And then it's another 19 years before the third deportation. What's interesting about that in God's taking care of his people is he sent Daniel ahead of time. Think back to Genesis 37 and following, when God sent Joseph ahead of time into Egypt to prepare the way and make the incubation of his people a good experience, at least for a time under Egypt. And in Daniel's day, those 70 years of Babylonian exile were prepared in a significant way by God through Daniel to administrate in the country, in the nation, to take care of his people uh, so that they, had, um, they were given some privileged status. Now, why is there an exile to begin with? This is a period, as one author has said, of misery, degradation, and confusion. If you were a Jew and you knew your Old Testament history and you knew the promises of God, you must be thinking in Babylonian exile, what are we doing here? How did this all happen? Are God's promises no good? Are we truly low ami, that is, not my people? Are we no longer God's people? Are the promises broken? And how has this come about? Or maybe worse, maybe the thought is, Maybe Yahweh's not really supreme. Maybe the gods of the Assyrians are stronger. Maybe the gods of the Babylonians are stronger. I mean, they've, they've got several, and, and we've been worshiping them all along anyway. Maybe they really are better. 
And Daniel exists to help us understand nothing could be farther from the truth. The, the nation of Israel is in exile because God is God. Because their God is the one true God. He made promises to them. And when we think about Israel's constitution and covenant, that is the establishment of, of, of the nation of Israel after coming out of Egyptian slavery through the Exodus, and God met them at Mount Sinai and said, here's how I want you to live. You're going to be unique. You're going to be different in the world. You're going to represent me. The nations are going to stream to you in order to see me and know me, and you're going to live different. You're going to eat different. You're going to do stuff different on Saturdays. You're going to wear different clothes. You're going to treat your cattle different. You're going to be peculiar people on the earth. Because I'm holy, and you're going to be set apart to me. That was Israel's fundamental constitution. That's how they were formed as a country. This was going to be a theocracy on the earth. This was going to be God's government on the earth through a people. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. <clears throat> this is the section, of course, of the ten words the Ten Commandments, they become sort of shorthand and a centerpiece for Mosaic law. And there are vertical and horizontal, horizontal components to these ten words. Look with me at Exodus 20, beginning in verse 1. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahweh your God. Stop right there. Just notice that the transcendent, infinite God of the universe who spoke the created order out of nothing. He needs nothing. He's dependent on nothing. He has identified himself with a people. He uses a possessive pronoun. I am your God. He's drawn near to a sinful people who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Not only did he make himself known to them and be willing to be identified with them, but he also rescued them physically out of slavery. And then here are God's obligations for his people. Verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. That is not a statement, by the way, of priority, but one of proximity. God is not saying, look, you can have all the gods you want, but I'm going to be number one. <laughs> when he says you are to have no gods before me, he's not saying give me first place amongst them. He his people are not to have any gods before him, in his presence, before his face. When, when you read this prohibition, look, I am God, you are mine, I rescued you, no other gods. I don't want to see them. Don't put them before me. What has Israel done in all of her history? Think about Abraham, Abe, Abram, taken from where? Babylon, <laughs> Ur of the Chaldees. And, and you see these things where Abraham is called out and he clearly loves the Lord and he believes God and is justified by faith and every once in a while these little idols show up in his saddlebags. <laughs> Idolatry is just there in Israel's history from the beginning. And you go from the patriarchs to the cycle of the judges and the downward spiral of idolatry every single generation and then God's gracious rescue. And then you go to the kings and it's just idolatry after idolatry after idolatry. I said it this morning, I'll say it again, it's as if the, gods of the, or as if the nations could not invent gods fast enough for Israel to play the harlot with all of them. And so you have the refrain through all of the prophets on every high hill and under every green tree, you worship this God and that God and this God and that God. And you think about the golden age of Israel's history, the dedication of the temple, 1 Kings 8. And Solomon there prays to the one true God and says, all the nations will stream to Israel and come to know you. Three chapters later, Solomon has married foreign women. He gave himself to them in love and he brought their idolatrous altars into Jerusalem and all over the countryside. <laughs> you shall have no other gods before me. It's all Israel seemed to do from their constitutional days all the way to the exile. The next commandment, verse 4, You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven on earth or beneath or in the water or under the earth. They did that over and over again. Verse 5, You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God. 
they worshiped and served them and provoked God to jealousy. Verse 7, you shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain. Um, what does that mean? That, that doesn't mean just don't say his name when you're not intending to say his name. To, the, the Hebrew word nasa means to carry along or to bear along. It means do not carry along Yahweh's name to no effect. If we're to colloquialize this in our day, we would say don't just call yourself a Christian and live otherwise. Calling yourself by the name of Yahweh, taking along the name of Yahweh means your whole life is His and it ought to be seen. It ought to be known. And what did Israel do? They worship me with their lips, they honor with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. This was Israel's history. And then they were to be a unique people uh, as related to days. On the seventh day, on the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Set it apart unto Yahweh. You are a set apart people, therefore set it apart for me. And then you have all the horizontal uh, prohibitions and regulations in 12 to 17. You're to love each other according to God's word. Your lives are to be governed by God's obligations. Now listen, this constitutional document from God, these obligations from God, also came with promises. Deuteronomy 28 says, It shall be, if you diligently obey Yahweh your God, be careful to do His command which I, which I command you, then Yahweh your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Who was supposed to be the world power? Israel. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord, Lord your God. Can you imagine being overtaken by Yahweh's blessings? Harvests so plentiful that your John Deere tractors can't keep up. Just remarkable blessing, prosperity, goodness, joy, happiness, a spiritual vertical joy and also physical blessings in the land. This is what God promised them if they would obey. And then also the Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself as he swore to you if you keep the commandments of Yahweh your God and walk in his ways so that all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of Yahweh and they will be afraid of you. Conversely, Deuteronomy 28 verse 63, it shall come about that as the Lord delighted over you to prosper you and multiply you, if you disobey, the Lord will delight over you to make you perish and destroy you. You will be torn from the land where you are entering to possess it. Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all the peoples from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. Among those nations you will find no rest. There will be no resting place for the sole of your foot, but there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and despair of soul. Deuteronomy 28, 63 is the path that Israel chose. And she has never yet recovered. And while it's true that post-exile Israel was committed monotheistic, she has never yet been returned to the land with blessing under covenant promise. That has not yet happened. Why the exile? I'll turn you to 2 Chronicles 36, beginning in verse 11. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of Yahweh his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke for the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear allegiance by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord God of Israel. By the way, Zedekiah was a political opportunist. He pledged allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar because Jeremiah said you were supposed to. That would be obedience to the Lord. And then when Nebuchadnezzar was present, yeah, I'll obey you. I'll give you tribute. And then when Nebuchadnezzar was gone and out of sight, he's making allies with Nebuchadnezzar's enemies. He disobeyed the Lord and out of political expediency thought he could make his own path. Furthermore, verse 14, all the officials of the priests and the people were very unfaithful. They were following the abominations of the nations. They defiled the house of the Lord, which he had sanctified in Jerusalem. And Yahweh, the God of their fathers, sent word to them again and again by his messengers, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they continually mocked the messengers of God, despised his word, scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people, until there was no remedy. 
Therefore, he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, that's Nebuchadnezzar, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary. He had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or infirm. He gave them all into his hand. All the articles of the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king and his officers, he brought them to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its fortified buildings with fire, destroyed all its valuable articles. Those who had escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, and they were servants to him and to his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths, all the days of its desolation it kept Sabbath until 70 years were complete. Why the exile? Because Assyria was strong? Because the sun god of Babylon was some big deal? Because Nebuchadnezzar was an astute general and was able to conquer the world in his own power? No. Because the sovereign God of the universe, the maker of the heavens and earth, had pledged his own loyalty to this peculiar nation, Israel, and had kept his promises, both for their disobedience and one day for their repentant obedience. Why does Daniel tell the future in this book? He gives us events of world history from Nebuchadnezzar to the second coming of Christ. We're talking about a span of history from 600 B.C. until, no, I'm not going to give you a date. No man knows the day or the hour. Don't even try it. But whenever Christ comes back. And he details successive empires, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. He talks about Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar of Babylon, and Cyrus, he refers to Camses, Darius, Xerxes, Artaxerxes, and Alexander the Great, the Seleucid and Ptolemies, uh, who were the outflows of Alexander the Great's empire when it was divided, and, and how they battle back and forth over Palestine. He describes Antiochus Epiphanes, even Bernice and Cleopatra, and the rise of the Roman Empire. All of these things subsequent to Daniel's lifetime. Obviously, he was concurrent with the, the reigns of the kings that he spoke of in his day, but everything after that was pure, predictive future. And, and as we said before, prophecy in the Bible is simply history pre-written. What's so staggering about Daniel is to be able to look back in our secular history books and read what Daniel said would happen in minute detail over and over and over again, all the way through the Persian, the Greek empires to the uh, uh, rise, to the coming of Christ the first time, to his death and resurrection and departure, to the rise of the Roman Empire. And then, of course, there's this gap. And we don't know how long the gap is, but the details that Daniel records from his own lifetime up until the Roman Empire are so staggeringly accurate that the critics of Daniel said he's a fraud, he must have written after the fact. It's really a really remarkable thing. And it has its purpose. Daniel's not just showing off. Uh, God is not simply uh, giving us some sort of uh, curiosity boon. God is putting his own reputation at stake in telling exactly what would happen before it comes to pass so that the Jews would know God keeps his promises and he's actually in control, not the Gentile nations. And so that the Gentile nations would understand that they're not in control, God's in control, and his kingdom is coming and they're all in trouble. Daniel details the last seven years of the age of man the rise of the Antichrist. And Daniel finally gives us the glorious second coming of Messiah to the earth to set up his kingdom that will have no end. Daniel details for us 586 B.C. to the return of Christ. That really is an era called the times of the Gentiles. That is the label that Jesus gave to that time period. From the fall of Jerusalem until Christ comes back the second time. I don't know if you've ever been on YouTube and watched one of those animated maps of Europe. It's really fascinating. You can watch the last 2,000 years of a European map in about 10 minutes, and you just watch all the borders go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's almost nauseating. But you realize that this idea that empires rise and fall and rise and fall and rise and fall and rise and fall and rise and fall. God told us this would happen. This is nothing new. 
this is so helpful for us because we're, we're, in America, we're accustomed to a four-year cycle of presidential elections. That's weird. Right? Janet was just telling me last night, she's reading um, Margaret Thatcher's uh, memoirs or autobiography or something. And she covered what? Carter, Reagan, Bush? Uh, that's, that's longer than we're used to. Um, but outside of the American experiment, uh, sometimes the, the reigns of kings went longer than most of our lifespans and reigns of empires even longer. And yet they change and are exchanged with one another so quickly on the big scale of history that there are drops in the bucket. They are forgotten. If you watch one of those YouTube animations of European maps, you're going to see place names, country names that lasted for longer than the United States whose names we don't even remember anymore. And that's just the way of things. What is the theme of the book of Daniel? Uh, we might do this in several ways, but the gods of the nations are nothings. The wise men of the east are frauds. The kings of the earth are but tools in the hands of the king of kings and maybe this is the central theme, the sovereign God of heaven will establish his kingdom. That's the point of the book of Daniel. Let's talk finally about the usefulness of this book for our own hearts. John Calvin uh, wrote a thousand-page commentary on the book of Daniel. Uh, I don't know if I'll make all thousand of those pages. <laughs> But I was really intrigued by his introduction because he dedicated his commentary of Daniel to French Protestants. Daniel wrote from Geneva, and he wrote this dedication in 1561. By that time, he had been out of France for 26 years. France was his homeland. He, his real name is Jean Calvin, and he ate croissants. He knew what it was like to be in exile from his homeland. And he never went back. Uh, it was too hot. He was too well known. He appealed personally to the king of France. In fact, the Calvin's Institutes, we think of it as a systematic theology textbook. By the way, it's not dry. It's about the warmest devotional systematic theology you can get your hands on. It's worth a read. You won't agree with everything in it, but it's phenomenal. So worshipful. But he actually wrote that in its first edition as a letter to the king of France telling the king of France, stop persecuting Protestants. They believe the Bible. Here, let me explain what we believe. And he could never go back because he would have been hunted down as many of the Frenchmen were. He said, I have no desire to return to France, but I cannot forget you. And you need the book of Daniel for encouragement. Look, Daniel knew what it was like to live in exile. He resonated with Daniel. And he said, here then, we observe as in a living picture that when God spares and even indulges the wicked for a time, he proves his own servants to be like gold and silver. So we ought not consider it a grievance to be thrown into the furnace of trial when profane men enjoy the calmness of repose. That's a good word. I think sometimes for us we think, Oh, the people in power, they just get to do whatever they want and nothing bad ever happens to them. They never get investigated. The press doesn't report on what they do and everybody just goes along with it and here we are suffering the consequences of it. Well, God has something for us in that. The, the refinement of silver and gold is His precious people for His purposes that transcend whatever country we happen to live in under whatever petty tyrant we're suffering. God's purposes are much bigger than temporal comfort in a temporary society. Calvin knew that and sought to encourage the French with that. The, the French Protestants, the Huguenots, experienced the reality that Calvin described. Governments don't submit to Christ, and then mobs, for their own selfish benefit, go along with a tyrannical government and persecute Christians. Nothing new under the sun. He described their women being ravished, their children being murdered, and their homes plundered and burnt to the ground. Now, when Calvin wrote that in 1561, that was 11 years prior to St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. St. Bartholomew's Day was a government-sanctioned open season by the enemies of Protestantism. And the government basically just said, hey, if you want their stuff, 
you can go kill them and we won't prosecute. And the French cities did. In all the major French cities, they surrounded Christian churches, Christian homes, anybody that they could associate with evangelical doctrine, and sometimes their own Catholic enemies. Like, I have a Catholic uncle, and he didn't give me his inheritance, so I'm going to call him a Protestant, and we'll kill him too. And they just had a heyday and murdered tens of thousands. Eleven years before that time, Calvin said, you may experience more atrocious things than you already have, and they did. Calvin knew the book of Daniel was going to be helpful for persecuted believers in hostile empires. The Lisu tribe in Thailand, the Lisu is a uh, people group, tribal people group that spans parts of China, Thailand, and India. Um, in the 20th century in Thailand, a group of the Lisu people were getting a Bible translation for the very first time, much like our work in Papua New Guinea currently. And they were being oppressed not only by enemies within their tribe who were resistant to gospel progress, they were also being oppressed by the Marxist government, uh, Marxist oppressors in Thailand. And so as their Bible translation was being worked on, um, they, they said to their, to their missionaries who were translating the Bible, hey, finish Genesis later, give us Daniel. <laughs> and, and they begged the missionaries to hurry up and translate Daniel for them. Why? Because they could resonate with what it was like to be under a hostile environment and to trust the Lord in it. Now, there's a caution for us in this. Uh, there are interpreters throughout history who have decided that they were the last generation. And they open the book of Daniel, they look at the details of the prophecies of the book of Daniel, and they open their newspapers, and they say, aha, 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 this is us. And they put themselves as a pin on the map, and they go, we're right here. Uh, that would be an error. For everybody who's done it so far. Now, somebody's going to be right someday, right? Eventually, these things happen exactly according to the details that Daniel describes, but we would be in error if we followed basically every generation before us and said, yeah, we're in it. Here, here's me on page 12. Don't do that. That would be unhelpful. That actually discredits the message when we shade the details of the text to try to make it fit our current situation in some sort of eschatological curiosity, right? But that was popular in every successive generation. In fact, Wycliffe did it, Luther did it. Um, who was the Antichrist for Wycliffe? The Pope. Who was the Antichrist for Luther? The other Pope. In fact, it was very common in early Protestant Reformation history to identify the Pope with the Antichrist and to work out the details of Daniel and Revelation with all the machinations of European politics. It didn't quite fit, but we can kind of make it close because there's a lot of similarities. That would be a wrong way to approach the book. Um, we've got to be content with examining Daniel and its details, saying what it says, and, huh, can't wait to see how that turns out. <laughs> Someday... Some group of faithful believers in Christ will find themselves exactly in the details of Daniel's 70th week, the last seven years of man's history before Christ's kingdom comes. It will have particular application to them. But in the meantime, you've had the Maccabeans who decided, yeah, this is about us, and they revolted against the, the government. Um, you, you have a World War I, World War II. And basically every Middle Eastern conflict in the 20th century, you had evangelical writers writing a new book and making money because they identified Saddam Hussein with somebody in Daniel or Russia with something in Daniel or whatever. We don't want to do that. Make no mistake that the Great Tribulation, Daniel's 70th week, will be the worst time in human history and it will not be regional. It will be global. Jesus himself said there's no time like it before, no time like it after. And it's a good thing it's short. <laughs> there will be no mistaking for those people who are in that time period. And trust me, in terms of the roller coaster of nation building and regime collapse, that is the history of human civilizations, there is nothing for us to do but trust God and preach His gospel. Some people, when they read Daniel or Revelation, they start to think, ooh, this is what's going to happen. It's going to be a map for us. So, hmm, I know how to invest in the stock market. If these things happen, grain's going to be worth a lot. <laughs> People write about these things. 
There are cults and Christianisms that actually make their identity around finding themselves in some obscure prophetic reference and then building their schemes around it, money-making schemes. Listen, there are others who believe that the kingdom of God is something that is brought about by human politics, that it's something that is brought about by the faithful, that it's brought about by influence into the culture and society. That is not the message of Daniel. That is not the message of the kingdom of God anywhere in the scriptures. The reality that Daniel describes for us is there there is a kingdom that is coming at the end of the revived Roman Empire that will crush it to smithereens, scatter it like chaff, and be the end of all of man's empires. And it will have no end. That's Daniel's message. Listen, if you were an Israelite in Babylonian exile, man, that's such great hope. But but we got to wait for the Persians and then the Greeks and then the Romans and who knows how long that's going to go before we see the kingdom. That's right. Jesus himself said there will be wars and rumors of wars, but that is not yet the end. You and I cannot avoid the machinations of tyrants and kings. There's no way for us to end the, the birth pangs of earth's groaning. There's no way for us to end depravity exercised through human government. That is something only Messiah can do. Jesus said to Pontius Pilate in John 18, 36, My kingdom is what? Not of this world. If you're Pilate and you're trying to get off the hook here, man, is this guy something? Wife had a bad dream about him. I really want to wash my hands of this guy. Wait, are you a king? My kingdom's not of this world. Whew. Okay, he doesn't have a standing army outside of Jerusalem. Okay, you can kill him. <laughs> well, listen, it is going to be so much worse for the likes of Pilate than a standing army ready to take over your country. Because Jesus' kingdom, which is not of this world, will come to this world, and every petty human tyrant that meets Christ face to face will have a far worse fate than just losing their earthly kingdom. You and I need to remember this. Jesus will bring his not of this world kingdom to the earth, and he will reign. That kingdom will have no end. And it will be unmistakable. Daniel, of course, speaks about Messiah in two comings. And when Jesus the Messiah came the first time, he was cut off. That is, he was killed by his own people. And of course, those empires had a hand in it too. And there's a sense in which every sinner forgiven by the blood of Christ has a hand in the death of Messiah at his first coming. It is our sins that held him there on the cross under the justice of God. It is by his blood we are forgiven. He came the first time as a suffering servant to pay for the sins of everyone who would believe. And Daniel speaks about the second coming of Christ, the second coming of the anointed one, the Messiah, when he will come, having already taken care of sin, to judge, to rule, to reign. And in one fell swoop, Jesus will end all the back and forth tug of war and all the tumults of human politics. He will put to rest all of the envy and strife and malice that comes with depraved humans in power. Jesus will have his throne. As Luke 1 says, he will sit on the throne of his father David and he will rule from Jerusalem and Judea over all the nations of the earth. And never again will there be a petty tyrant who thinks he's in charge. The theme of Daniel, God, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, is the only God. He is the God of heaven, and he rules. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the whole sweep of human history we will get in this book. Help us, O Lord, by it, to get from it what you design. Let us be your faithful people. 
in the midst of whatever you have for us, prosperity, fiery furnaces, or anything in between, we are yours. We love you. We don't love you perfectly. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen.